Next up, we have Dr. Sean Young, who's the founding director of the UCLA Center for Digital Behavior and is an assistant professor of family medicine at UCLA. Um, as an aside, if you came to this panel, you're probably interested in health, behavior, change, technology, et cetera. So I would uh, urge you guys to check out the center's website um, from uh, Dr. Young. Uh, to that end, today he's going to be presenting on social media big data for predicting health, behavior, change, and outcomes. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm a behavioral psychologist, and the work that we do at our center is on looking at how we can use digital technologies to create lasting health behavior change. So we'll bring together researchers from psychology, from medicine, uh, computer science, engineering, and business. Uh, so to start, I want to talk about real-time social media, some of our work on how you can use it for monitoring health outcomes. So let's start. Who, who in using Twitter, how many of you guys, is probably 90% of you here use Twitter? Raise your hand if you use Twitter. Big Twitter group. Who has some interesting examples of tweets they've read, things that are funny or entertaining? Who can think of some tweets that they've read that they want to share with the group that are Someone give an example of a, a funny or an entertaining, inspiring tweet? Sure. Chip a joke? What, what was that? I'd like to tell you, but I can't. There you go. Good academic joke. Who else? Anyone else have, have uh, funny tweets that they've? that they've seen, that they can remember. There's, there's one that I saw. I mean, so Twitter, Twitter's used for, uh, people say all kinds of crazy things on Twitter. Um, it can be used on the MedX hashtag right now. People are talking about the conference and saying things that are valuable about the conference that are helpful, teaching the rest of us. People use Twitter for their business. Um, and then there's, I've seen tweets about what people can dip their testicles in. And there's all kinds of crazy you know, jokes. And, and so the question is, is Twitter just, uh, is it a method for business and conferences and jokes? Or is it something where as public health and, and medicine people, can we use it for something valuable? Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to do something that you're not supposed to do in talks, but people are restless and, and want to get to information quickly. So this is the conclusion right here. Uh, so this slide shows a tweet map. These are tweets that around the country where people have talked about topics that put them at risk, um, that show that there's some risk for HIV. To talk about this. This was in a paper that we did that um, earlier this year in the journal Preventive Medicine. So the background for this work, we've in our center we've done a lot of work on social media to change, to create lasting behavior change. Um, here's an example of, of one of our papers. This was focused on HIV prevention. And we created a, a method called HOPE, Harnessing Online Peer Education, which led to really high rates of engagement, got people who are at risk for diseases to join our online community, get really involved in the community, change their behaviors, and then they stay involved in the community over time. Um, and we noticed something really interesting is that, so here's a, a breakdown. This was from one of the first studies we did back in 2009. Um, each of these bars represents four weeks. So um, one is the first four weeks, two is the second four weeks, three is the, the third four weeks because it's a 12-week intervention that we do. And what we noticed, um, so first, just as the intervention, we saw that friendly conversation, things like people talking on the online about friendly topics, that decreased over time. It was heavy in the beginning. And then the conversations about HIV testing increased over time, which was good for the intervention because we were 
trying to change people's HIV testing behaviors. But the other thing that was really interesting we noticed was that starting at the very beginning, people were really comfortable sharing all kinds of personal information. And these were strangers. We recruited this group in particular was uh, African American and Latino men who have sex with men. They didn't really know each other. We invited them to join this online community. <coughs> they weren't really knowing why, but they quickly started sharing all kinds of personal information with each other. So that was one thing that we noticed that was happening. The other thing, um, around the same time, you guys might remember and, and have read about how Twitter's been used to detect outbreaks of the flu. So Google Flus looked into this for search terms, and, and Twitter, uh, people were looking to use Twitter and have done some work on how Twitter can, can be used to detect uh, influenza outbreaks by looking at tweets people are talking about, like cough and fever um, and flu. So we put these together and we wanted to look at uh, HIV related topics on Twitter because at the same time, this was a really interesting article that came out. It was the first time from studying this stuff for 15 years, there was, this was the first time in 2009 where I noticed in popular press uh, there was an article about how people were using Craigslist and starting to use social media sites for sex seeking. So it was, it was really important all of these things coming together and, and had us think, okay, maybe we can look at how people are using social media. We know that they're using it for sex seeking. We know that we can use social media now for detecting things like influenza outbreaks. Can we look at people's HIV risk behaviors and be able to detect behaviors that people are engaging in that may be putting them at risk uh, based on how they're using social media? So back to the back to the tweet. So the question is, can we use real-time social media for predicting HIV behavioral outcomes. That was really what we were looking to do. So just a quick background on HIV epidemiology. Um, Los Angeles, just like in most of the rest of the United States, African Americans and Latinos are at high risk for HIV. Men who have sex with men account for over three out of four of all infections. Drug use is associated with HIV, um, and we found Internet and social media are associated with HIV risk, so people who seek sex online have higher risk for HIV. We also knew that the demographics of social media is changing, and you guys being here all know this. Um, so there's been a big change from 2000 to 2010, African American and Latino Internet users, uh, dramatic increases. 70% um, of African Americans and English-speaking Latinos use social networking sites compared to approximately 60% of whites. And here are just some charts of visualizations of that changing over time from 2000 to 2006, increase um, among blacks and Hispanic internet. Um, these are, I told Susanna Fox, pretty much every presentation we use some Pew slides. Uh, so here are here's one of them, just where you can see that African Americans and Latinos are rapidly adopting social networking sites, online video, Twitter, social media. And and this is important in the context again of HIV because these populations are at high risk for HIV. Um, similarly, um, <coughs> men who have sex with men are at high risk for HIV. We also find that um, that gay populations are rapidly adopting social media. So what we wanted to do was look at can we use Twitter as a tool for identifying behavioral risk? And in, in Twitter, we would generalize to real-time social media. But, you know, for example, Twitter. We looked at can we extract psychological information and behavioral information from the tweets. So in the case of HIV, since drug use and sexual risk behaviors are associated with HIV, can we look at tweets 
that are suggesting people may be engaging in drug or sexual risk behaviors. Second, can we then map those tweets and see where they're occurring, where people are tweeting about these things? And then third, ultimately, can we use this as a, as a method of remote monitoring for HIV outcomes? So we connected to the Twitter API, and this was um, this was in June to December of 2012. We started streaming tweets, collecting them, and we were collecting tweets that were geolocated in real time, had social network data, and uh, then we connected this to the AIDS View the AIDS View database. AIDS View database is the CDC's collection. It's from back in 2009 of HIV prevalence. So it has a map of HIV cases around the country. So we collected uh, about 550 million tweets. Then we looked at those that were geolocated, so that were in the United States. That left us with about 2.1 million tweets. Um, we went through a process of doing a keyword and ultimately phrases, and um, this was an iterative process to, to define um, an algorithm for finding tweets that were associated with HIV risk behaviors. And so we first bucketed into drug-related keywords versus sexual risk-related keywords. Um, and then from there, we merged that with county-level data we had on HIV. Should I stop here? Any questions so far? Does this important in terms of the method? So here's an example of some of the tweets, uh, example types of tweets that were shared. So general tweet could be, weather's crazy. Uh, a substance use related tweet, someone might say, anybody want to get high? And then the sex-related tweets could be, I need sex now. OK, so then we, we collected those tweets, and we merged them with the AIDS view data set. And what we wanted to do was look at, so where are these tweets occurring on the map? And is there a relationship between where these tweets are occurring and where we find HIV cases that are occurring? So this back to that original slide to the conclusion. So this is a map of where we found those HIV-related tweets. Um, so you can see the distribution across, across the United States. And then what we did, these are just the, the tweets. And then here's AIDS view. So this is what it looks like broken down at a county level of HIV cases. Again, this is from 2009. That'll be a limitation that uh, I'm just giving you guys a heads up on a limitation of that. Uh, and then the final. So then we found a significant relationship that the tweets that were occurring were coming from the same counties where we found HIV cases are occurring. So this isn't to say that we're necessarily predicting HIV cases, but as a preliminary study, it's finding a good relationship where we can use social media as methods for identifying, monitoring, and mapping where HIV cases are occurring. So again, conclusion, um, we looked at real-time social media for monitoring HIV behaviors and outcomes. We extracted psychological behavioral information from those tweets that they convey drug and sexual risk, identified the location of those tweets on a US map, and this has the, it has the potential for being used for remote monitoring of diseases and outcomes, because we found that these HIV risk-related tweets were associated with 
there be cases at a county level controlling for a lot of things like socioeconomic status. We can get into that in the, if you guys have questions about that. So this work was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and I had my Twitter handle up there where you guys, if you have questions or you want to tweet. So mine is Sean Young PhD and our center is CDB UCLA. Thank you. No doubt. <laughs> yes, there will definitely be. Um, so I think we're doing a lot of work right now with our online community work. And we're going back. We're starting this in Peru, actually, because we believe it's, it's important to start the, the ethical questions. And we're doing work internationally to start this internationally. Um, so we're going back into Peru, and we're starting to survey a lot of people who've been part of our previous online community studies and find out what were the experiences participating, were they aware of the consent forms, did they understand it, um, what were their concerns and privacy issues. We're finding overall that they have had really good experiences, and, and in ethical terms, the benefits definitely outweigh the, uh, outweigh the risks. Um, but this is something that we're just starting to do. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. I mean, I think given that we live in a world where this is happening all around us, businesses are doing this. Facebook, I was talking to Facebook about this the other day, where they're interested in finding out what are people's perceptions of what's going on and the information that's being used about them. Um, I think given that we're living in a world that's where this is being done already, and it's increasingly so, um, public health officials will be able to use this public information, hopefully, for what we can agree on is our general good. Um, we're working on this right now with the CDC and with UNAIDS. Um, so hopefully that's some validation that at least other larger um, government officials and centers believe that it's ethical. But it, I mean, it's a good question. I don't have the answer to it. have to study it. We did. So that was one of, um, within the data sets, there was population density, number of tweets overall that are being tweeted out, and you know, another me measure of population density, uh, Gini index, which is a poverty index of socioeconomic status. We also looked at time of day when people are tweeting that yeah, we controlled, but we did. So are you saying, so in major metropolitan areas where, uh, let's say, take Los Angeles, where there's higher HIV rates compared to other smaller cities, um, not just by density, but, but in places where there's higher HIV rates, people might be talking about HIV-related topics at a higher rate, um, and that's creating this relationship? Yeah, I think that's a valid point. I mean, even more of a point, the reason why I brought up that the that the data set on cases we were using was from 2009. Even more of a point is we were looking at tweets from 2012 and data from 2009. So it's this is definitely not, not saying that we are predicting future cases at this point. This is just there had been no studies looking at can we predict behaviors or monitor behaviors. Um, and we find this relationship. And so we're starting right now with our computer science groups to just start collecting tweets and do prospective studies of this and work with government.
Yes, yeah, so we're, we're starting to develop the infrastructure for that. So within our center, we're working with the computer science department and some people who are uh, developing the big data infrastructure of how can we in real time be able to stream and have uh, machine learning algorithms to be able to analyze this effectively. But that's something we're in process of starting to do. Um, we, so we've thought about other platforms to integrate ultimately in this when we're doing these prospective studies. This was a, a first stab at preliminary work. We've used Facebook and we now have our own online community based on what patients have requested from us that's important in changing behavior. So ultimately we'll look at all of those but we haven't done, we haven't really done any validation other than the Facebook work that we had done with our early Facebook communities was what stimulated the idea for this research. So, but we haven't done any cross-validation. Good question. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Yen, for a presentation. Thanks.